Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Battlefield, Pennsylvania. Today we're on location at the Fulton Theater in Lancaster. In December of 1763, a group of rebels known as the Paxton Boys attacked and killed a peaceful community of Conestogas. The event was received with terror throughout the colony, and most would agree it was the end of William Penn's peaceable kingdom. I'm your host, Brady Kreitzer. Joining me today to discuss the massacre of the Conestogas is author and investigative journalist Jack Brubaker and Native American Eastern Woodlands Indian educator Mary Ann Robbins. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tell us about your background. Well, I was born in Burden Hand, which is uh, in Lancaster County, and uh, went to school locally in Dickinson College, and then became a journalist and uh, wound up my career as an investigative reporter. I've written six books, including a book about the massacre. I was born on the Onondaga Indian Reservation, which is located in Syracuse, New York, and went to Boston College, where I earned a degree in biology and the sciences, and moved to Pennsylvania to work in the nuclear field, and here I stayed. Uh, if we would have been here in 1763 in this region, what would we have seen? Back at that time, uh, most of the lower Susquehanna, there were still natives or fragments of native groups. The Shanks Ferry, which is little known about them, some of the remainders that would have blended in with the Conestogas and the Susquehannocks. We also had some Shawnee that were in the lower Susquehanna area towards Maryland, and you would also have had the Mohawks from the east and also the Seneca coming down into this area. It, it was a very complex situation, not only with the Native Americans, these various refugee groups from outside the area had come in, uh, but there was a, a, a quite a diverse group of Western Europeans here, English, Germans, Scots-Irish, French, and, and so on. So it was quite, quite a mixture of, uh, of peoples. The British will score a major victory at the end of the Seven Years' War, which gives them effective control of all of North America. How does this affect the lives of Native peoples in this region? Some of the Native groups, as Jack said, the political part of that, some of the Natives decided to go with the British and some with the French, and that caused a bit of concern within the nations being split, namely the what is currently now called the Haudenosaunee Confederacy or what people call the Iroquois Confederacy. That caused a big rift between our people before we formed our own alliance, which is called the Iroquois Confederacy now today. I might add that the Native Americans, um, many of, most of the Native American groups made the mistake of supporting the French during the French and Indian War. So they were on the losing side. And um, same during the Revolution. And that, that caused problems for obvious reasons. This event really begins with an event we call Pontiac's Rebellion. Could we briefly touch on what that was about? Pontiac's Rebellion was, was one of the most successful, if not the most successful, counterattack by Native Americans against the, the Western expansion by Europeans who moved here. Uh, it started in the Detroit area and moved through Ohio into Western Pennsylvania. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of, of colonists were killed uh, um, forts were taken over and so on. The Indians moved the whole way into central Pennsylvania and threatened people who thought with the end of the French and Indian War that they were safe here on the frontier. Um, this Pontiac's Rebellion was, a, was a, in retrospect, was a natural occurrence because the Indians saw that with the French out of the way after the French and Indian War, the English had no one to impede them from moving into new Native American lands, but the Native Americans in themselves. And so they had to fight back. 
part of that process, once they had no other allies, the English quickly took over and the native groups which aligned with the British no longer wished to be part of that. However, they saw that the expansion was taking place and slowly would take over their own territories of those that were their allies and helped in defeating the French. How did this war affect life in this area? Well, the, the major disruption was uh, the, the, the killing of the last of the, of the Indian groups in Lancaster County, the Conestogas. Um, it also disrupted life, daily life, for people who lived in the Lancaster area. Um, various militias were set up to protect the frontier settlements, including Lancaster County, which at that time extended into Dolphin and Lebanon County as well. They, they didn't exist. That was part of Lancaster County. And so those militia groups were sent up to the northern end of Lancaster County to protect Lancaster. Uh, same with in Berks County to protect the Reading area. Um, people here were very frightened of what might happen if hostile Native Americans came down into this territory. And that resulted eventually in the killing of the last peaceful Indians. You touched on an important name in that last answer, the Conestogas. Who were they and what was their role in this region? The Conestogas are a remnant of the Susquehannocks. The Susquehannocks were the, uh, a, a great tribe, a great nation of Indians in uh, central Pennsylvania. They controlled all of central Pennsylvania. There were thousands of them in the 1500s and well into the 1600s, but their major uh, enemy, the Iroquois, eventually defeated them um, in, in uh, this area. And, um, they had been very powerful in Lancaster County and then moved across the river to York County. Defeated them there, and they moved to Virginia where um, nobody wanted them. The, the American Indians there didn't want them there, and the, the colonists certainly didn't. They killed all their chiefs and eventually the few who were left came back to Lancaster County and settled at Conestoga and were called Conestogas, even though Conest the, the, the population of Conestoga, which was very small, 90 or 100 people, were made, they were made up of not only Conestogas, who were the descendants of the Susquehannocks, but also various refugee tribes, the Senecas especially, from New York, from the Iroquois, and uh, Shawnee, and, and so on. It was a conglomeration of Indian groups living at Conestoga. With the disagreements within the tribes at the time, as Jack said, the Seneca were more powerful, as was the Iroquois Confederacy. So when you have the Mohawks coming down from the east, the Senecas coming down from the west, and almost like surrounding them. So the Susquehannocks were literally taken in by the Senecas at the time. They would become like big brothers, more like a protection of what you'd say today. I come down, I will help you, but with that, we will protect you and keep at bay other warring tribes that would come into the area. However, at the time, the Christianized Indians is what they were called, the fragments of the Conestogas, which was a mix of other natives, as Jack said. Some of the Conestogas, the Senecas, possibly some Mohawks and the Shawnee, were Christianized. They had become farmers. They planted crops, and they didn't live like they had in the past. So you're taking a, a group of people who no longer functioned in their own society as hunter-gatherers and planters, but were now confined to a small area where they could not roam as freely and lived out their days in protection due to fear from the colonists of what could happen should natives that were coming down from Ohio. 
some of the Senecas, some of the Mohawks that could come down and literally cause a lot of problems for the settlers. I believe that hype and fear, and fear causes a lot of unwanted thoughts, and those fears can become reality, and I believe that's what festered within all others to wreak havoc on the remaining peaceful Conestogas. This region saw a lot of intermixing of cultures, European groups and native groups. How did that play out on a regular basis? Uh, the two largest groups were the English and the Germans. Uh, Scots-Irish probably was, would have been the third largest group. But then there were others, uh, French Huguenots, um, Swiss, most of the Western European countries were represented. The English and the Germans, however, had by far the largest numbers and they were uh, sometimes in conflict. William Penn had a good insight and good relations with the native people. And up until that time, it was a peaceful society. They almost, you could say, coexisted. There was a mutual respect for the natives that was given by and shown by William Penn. However, his son did not feel that that should be his position. When you have someone who is not thinking along those same lines, it doesn't take too long before you start seeing a divide. And with that divide and having land being taken over, most of the native land was already cleared. So it was easy for those that came to take over that, either by selling it outright or what the natives perceived util utilizing or maybe using the land, but not literally taking the land. The, the thought processes and, and understanding what native people use of the land was and what the English the Germans' use of the land. One is, I take it, I own it, and the natives at the time is, you know, the land is used for all. You can't pick it up and take it with you. Historically, we call this event the Paxton Boys' Rebellion. The word Paxton being most important. Uh, where was that and who were these people? Pa Paxton is a, was an early settlement on the Susquehanna River north of here generally in the Harrisburg, where Harrisburg is now. And uh, Paxton was, an un, was a, a, probably a typical community for the time. It didn't have a central government. It did have a strong religious structure. All, most all the people who lived in Paxton were Presbyterians. They went to Paxton Presbyterian Church. And John Elder, who was uh, the... Um, minister of that church was also the, um, the commander of the militia that was formed during Pontiac's rebellion. So he was certainly the leader of that Paxton community. Paxton was built on the ruins of an Indian village. Uh, the settlers had come in and pushed the Indians out. And then uh, the Indians during the French and Indian War early on raided Paxton and killed a number of people and uh, created a lot of the ill will that the Paxton boys uh, later carried with them. Was it common for a minister in the 18th century to lead a military unit? It was. It was very common because they were often the leaders of their communities. So John Elder was hardly the only minister. And it was often the Presbyterian ministers who were militia leaders. They, they were Scots, often Scots-Irish. And the Scots-Irish were used to fighting the English for years and years. They were good fighters. The English put them on the frontier as a buffer against the Native Americans because uh, they knew they would be good fighters. So they were naturally situated to become uh, those fighters and their, their ministers became their commanders. Is it fair to say that the frontier settlers disliked 
the Quaker elites of Philadelphia? Uh, yes. <laughs> Animosity is, is a, a light word for that. Um, many of the settlers on the actual frontier did. The Scots-Irish, for example, were very disturbed by the attitude in Philadelphia, which was l led by the, the Quakers. The government was, was led by the Quakers and uh, the provincial government, led by the Pens, um, seemed to have no um, concern about the Scots-Irish uh, ability to, to fend off the, the Indians on, um, on their front. And the uh, Quakers were often seen as being more supportive of the Indians than of the Scots-Irish themselves. And so that was a cause of, of much of the friction between the two groups that exploded into this massacre. You mentioned an important name, the minister John Elder. Uh, what role did he play in this, and what did he tell his people to do that led to this event? John Elder, we believe, I believe, this, this is controversial because there's no record of any of his sermons. But numerous Presbyterian ministers at the time wrote and said things that were um, absolutely detrimental to, to the Indians. Uh, they thought of them as heathen. They quoted scripture often that, um, that, that uh, argued for, for eliminating the heathen from the face of the earth. As I said, we don't know that John Elder said those exact words, but there's no reason to believe that he didn't have that same sort of feeling, which was not um, limited just to Presbyterians, by the way. Um, a large number of Western Europeans living in this area felt that way. It's, 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 it was the rationale for getting rid of the Indian population. From the native perspective of what we feel happened is that John Elder, because of the power that he had over the community, and seeking more land for his community, chose to kind of plant a seed that would set the wheels in motion. And with that, without taking part, actually set them off within their minds to commit these atrocities. One of the important moments of the Paxton Boys' Rebellion is December 14th. Could you take us through the events of that day? Uh, I would say it started before the 14th. Both John Elder in Paxton and Edward Shippen, who was the chief magistrate of Lancaster, knew that the Paxton Boys were going to raid Conestoga Village and did nothing about it. Um, that's, that's established fact. Um, on the 14th, the Paxton Rangers, they were called at that time, they were called boys later for reasons we don't know. Uh, the Rangers came down from the Paxton area, then along the Susquehanna, stayed overnight in the Columbia area, and then attacked the village at daybreak. And they used, on pur purposeful, purposefully, they used the implements that Native Americans had used against them. They used, well, they used their, their flintlocks, first of all, but they also used tomahawks, and then they used scalping knives. They're, they killed six people at Conestoga, uh, five adults and one, one small boy. The other uh, 14 es escaped. Um, they, it was a very snowy winter, and they were out selling their brooms and baskets, which is what uh, the Conestogas did to make money uh, in the winter, and um, they got caught out in a snowstorm and escaped the first slaughter. It's important we clarify, these were not warriors that were attacked. These were innocent people. They were, they were primarily children, women, and old men. Hardly ones that you think could fend off a group of men with flintlocks, being peaceful being put there for protection, not doing any harm. 
So you have to wonder what motivated them. In 1701, William Penn and the Conestogas signed a treaty. And in that treaty, they agreed that they would be as one heart, I think, forever. Um, that their, their, the government and the Indians would be as one. And this refuge was set aside for the Conestogas to live peacefully within the colony. Uh, there were numerous uh, suggestions that the Conestogas be moved out of the area, uh, occasionally by the Conestogas themselves, by John Elder, by John Harris, who was John Elder's friend up in the Paxton Harrisburg area. Um, but they were not moved because John Penn, who was William Penn's grandson, felt that it was important to have a group of peaceful Indians maintained within the bounds of the colony, uh, the, 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 uh, the white settlers of the colony, in order to show hostile Indians how peaceful Indians could live within the white community. And so they stayed there and died. Do you believe that the well-known history of the Conestogas made them a symbolic choice for the Rangers? Might have been. There's no, there's no record. We, we don't even know who the, the individual Rangers were, so we don't know all of their motivations. There were, uh, they had quite a few possible motivations. That, that's probably one of them, yes. But m more significant underlying that, which came out later in things that were written about the situation, is that uh, the, the Paxton people felt that an Indian was an Indian. And as one pamphlet writer later said, whoever goes to war with a group of people and, and not with the whole people. And, and so they di seemingly didn't care whether they were hostile or not. Their excuse given was that they were acting as spies for hostile Indians, although there's no proof of that. After the attack at Conestoga Manor, what was the overall reaction within the colony of Pennsylvania? Uh, Governor John Penn issued a proclamation calling for the um, arrest and trial of the, of the murderers of those, of those Conestogas. Because previous to this, there had been murders of, of Indians by white settlers, and the white settlers had been tried for it. Um, and so it was just expected that this would follow uh, this time. And then events came along too suddenly and that proclamation got lost in the, in the, in the events to come. What happened to the survivors of that attack? There were 14 survivors, one of whom was a, a small boy who was in the Conestoga village but somehow got away and ran and alerted the uh, community. And Edward Shippen, the chief magistrate, decided to take the Indians who were left, the small boy, Christy or Crisley, and the other 13, into the workhouse of the county. And this is important. This is one of the most important things about this whole incident is to remember that these people were under the protection of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And that's why Governor John Penn issued his proclamation. It was his responsibility, and he wanted to find the killers. And now they are under the protection of the county of Lancaster in the new workhouse, which was uh, built at this place where we are now. And so they're under the protection of two layers of government. Um, it it, it uh, boggles the mind to, to understand how that sort of thing would happen today without great outrage by many people. Can we talk about the location in which we're sitting right now? How did that relate to the event? Let's talk about uh, 2017 first. We're in the green room of the Fulton Opera House, the Fulton Theater, the green room where the actors prepare for their, before they go on stage. But this green room is approximately where the, the workhouse yard was, the outer yard was in 1763. In, in the um, 
1763, the Lancaster County Prison extended from here on Prince Street down to King Street. And this area was a workhouse. Uh, from here to Prince Street was a, work, was a workhouse. And the workhouse yard, the outside, where people uh, went in good weather, extended back to Water Street, which is behind us, and uh, a stream that ran down there called Roaring Brook. Roaring Brook. Um, the Indians were kept in the workhouse in December of a very cold year, and um, I'm sure they had no more than one fireplace. Um, and during sunny weather, I suspect that the kids went outside and played in the snow. There were seven adults and seven children in the workhouse. Three of those children were described as little. Within that time frame, imagine in December and it is cold and you have seven adults and you have seven children. And the adults range from elders down to middle-aged parents, and then you had the children. I believe the oldest was written as 12. And they're here for protection. They have no reason to fear. And yet, in that time frame, you have maybe a day's ride by the Paxons to come and finish what they had started. And that was to literally get rid of the native people of which they thought they were doing. And they come here and descend upon these natives. And within moments, wipe them out. The feeling at that time was that John Elder knew his parishioners because historically the areas and the towns were small enough that you could sneeze and your people would know who did that. Was it he did not want to acknowledge that he knew for fear that he could be in jeopardy of being sent to jail himself? arrested, the people within the community, they saw the Paxton boys leave. They know that. Why weren't their names? But to literally come here and truly massacre and slaughter. One of the writings I was looking at today as I was trying to recall this was the bloody aftermath of what was left and what area we're now sitting in. The day when the rangers arrive here, how long is that after the initial attack and what goes on in this place? Well, the, the first six Indians were killed on December 14th and the, um, the other 14 on December 27th, just about two weeks later, two days after Christmas. and. I would say anybody who knew anything about uh, Lancaster County at that time understood that the Paxton Rangers, Paxton boys, were going to come back and try to kill the rest of the Indians. They had missed the man that they really wanted, whose name was Will or Bill Sock or Sack, depending on who was saying or spelling his name. And uh, he was... Um, uh, a, a very um, knowledgeable and worldly Indian who um, had participated as a uh, translator in treaty sessions. He developed, helped develop the, the, the vocabulary of the Susquehannock, a little green book that has about 170 words, the only words we have from the Susquehannocks. Um, and they thought of him as the chief spy. And he survived, he wasn't in Conestoga. His brother George was and was killed there. But Will was, um, was in the workhouse 
they knew he was here, here and the magistrates guarded this workhouse on various nights between the 14th and the 27th. They would march up and down. The jailer was here. Um, they were guarding against a, a, a future attack. But yet on the day that they were actually killed on the 27th, on that afternoon, uh, the jailer was gone. Only the sheriff and uh, the coroner were here and they stepped aside and let it happen. The one thing about history that Native people understand is people are fearful of those that were in power at the time and it shows throughout history. The history is written by the conquerors, not by those that they have conquered. So we're looking at, again, people who John Elder knew, the sheriff knew they were coming. We believe that they knew they were coming. Otherwise, if they're guarded every day, but yet at this particular time, there was no one there. There was not anyone even within the streets. It was almost like a silent bell was rung that says at this time or approximately around this time, no one should be around. And the historical writings do say that there, there wasn't anybody around. It, it's difficult not to think conspiracies when it's known that at the time the Indians were killed in the workhouse, at the same, very same time, a Christmas service was being held at St. James Episcopal Church about three blocks east of here. At that service, Edward Shippen, the chief magistrate, the mayor of Lancaster, uh, uh, v various leaders of the community, including a future signer of the Declaration of Independence, were sitting in their pews listening to Thomas Barton, the minister, give a sermon. So many of the leaders of the town had, had a, an alibi, if you'd like, because they were in church when this was happening. It's, a, it's an unusual um, uh, confluence of, of events. And many people, especially the Quakers, of course, who uh, were pro-Indian and anti-Scots-Irish, uh, thought were very, very certain that there was a conspiracy, if not by the leaders, Elder and Shippen and so on, then by their various minions who helped put together this, uh, this, this whole scenario. The jailer, uh, over the years I've thought about this a lot, and to me the jailer's absence is the most telling. He sent his family away several days before the massacre, knowing or believing that there would be trouble, and then he himself left. Not only that, there were 200 British soldiers in the town at the time. Lancaster had about 2,000 inhabitants. There were 200 soldiers here. And Edward Shippen later said he didn't know that. They could have been guarding the Indians, but the magistrates were not aware that they were here in this little town. They killed the Indians here the same as they had killed them in Conestoga, but perhaps even more violently. Um, then they, they, had, they had stabled their horses up at uh, uh, Center Square, now Penn, called Penn Square where the Marriott and Convention Center are in downtown Lancaster. They stabled their horses there, walked down King Street Hill over to the workhouse, killed the Indians, walked back up the hill. This is on a work day when everybody's watching them go by. They got their horses, they rode three times around the courthouse, which was in the center of the square, uh, hollering and hallooing, and one uh, report said that they uh, said something about going on to Philadelphia and killing Indians there who were being held for their protection. So they took their good time getting out of town and then rode back up towards Paxton. Earlier we touched on the inherent dislike between the frontier settlers of this region and the more cosmopolitan elite of Philadelphia. How does that come into play after this event? Immediately after these 
the second attack. Edward Chippen and John Elder wrote letters, mainly saying, we didn't know anything about it. We couldn't do anything about it. It wasn't our fault. Um, John Penn, for his part, the, 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 uh, essentially the governor of Pennsylvania, although he was called lieutenant governor, um, he wrote a second pro proclamation saying that these, we've got to find the killers and we've got to uh, arrest them and try them for this murder. And a, a, a big show was made of finding the people who had committed this atrocity. And then nothing happened. The one thing that did happen that's very curious is that the magistrates in Lancaster took depositions from people who had reason to despise Indians. Instead of trying to find the killers, they found people who who hated Indians and took depositions from them. Uh, to me, that's one of the oddest things that, that occurred in this whole story. It's almost like they had to justify the means for what had happened. You go back to the conspiracy theory. Well, if you have men going around and around in the square, surely, as it was, People knew their neighbors. People knew who they were, either out of fear for what or repercussions of what could happen to them, to find people that could give the Indians an argument as to why. Should they have been killed? It's easier to say why they should be killed and finding those, and because at that time, land is the biggest threat that Native people would figure could be shared, but that didn't happen. So in history, if you do away with the Natives, then we can have the land. And the sad thing about that is it permeates that still today. The Rangers will target Philadelphia. They talk about it a lot. Does that ever happen? The Paxton Rangers who were then uh, later called boys on their march to Philadelphia. Uh, grew from a force of 50 to 100 people to maybe 500 people who marched on Philadelphia. There were a number of Indians there, a, lo a large number of Indians, over 100. Um, there were Lenny Lenapis, or Delawares, who had come down from the Moravian settlements near Bethlehem. And um, they were under the protection of the, of the Commonwealth, being held in Philadelphia. And the Paxton boys said, we're going to go there and kill them, unless, we get, uh, unless the demands that we have are, are, are listened to. And, they marched on Philadelphia. They got as far as Germantown, just north of Philadelphia, and stopped. And the people in uh, John Penn, he didn't have a standing army, but he got several hundred people together, including some Quakers who decided they would carry guns to, to uh, repel the invaders. And they fortified downtown Philadelphia. They were ready for the Paxton boys to attack. The reason a civil war did not erupt uh, was that um, Benjamin Franklin, uh, particularly, and a few other people went out and talked to the, to the Paxton boys, to their leaders, and uh, persuaded them not to come into town, but to go send most of, the, of that group home and just have a few leaders stay and talk with the governor. And eventually, after a week or so of discussions, the whole thing was diffused. And beyond that lies a political story which gets involved. They had all kinds of demands, something like a dozen. Uh, but uh, a couple of the main ones were that they wanted greater representation of the western counties, Lancaster and Berks and so on. Philadelphia, an area, Bucks, Delaware, Montgomery, had most of the representation, uh, mainly, mainly Quakers. 
but they, they had most of the representatives and the people out here had very few. Lancaster County, this huge area, Lancaster, Dolphin, Lebanon, had three representatives in Philadelphia. Um, beyond that, they wanted greater protection from Indian raids on the outer settlements, on the Scots-Irish and other uh, settlements and the farmers living on the frontier. Um, they, had, they had numerous demands. One was they wanted another. They wanted to reinstitute the scalp bounty. If, if they got a scalp from any Indian, they would get paid so much. And in fact, that was the only demand of all the demands that they made that they ever got out of this. Are the Paxton Rangers ever punished for this attack? No. No, none at all. No, there was no one to punish. Historically, <laughs> there were no ones identified or people failed to identify them, saying, again, turning a blind eye to that so no one was brought to justice for that. A lot of things have changed after this event. The Paxton Rangers have become known as the Paxton Boys. And the fact that we're only recently calling it the Conestoga Massacre shows that the way we think about the past has changed. How do you interpret that change? Well, in one of the things that um, we within the Native community did was um, to put back the plaque that gave a description of what happened on December 27th. That, with the help of Maya Gray helping us to locate that and do an unveiling within the town for that plaque to be presented. The other thing is we have worked within the church areas to help with the reconciliation and healing process because it would help on both sides. So in, two, in December 27th being the focal point, how could we bring these natives that were in this area along with some of the churches who at the time did not do enough to help prevent these atrocities from happening. So with that, the Amish, Mennonites, Presbyterians, and Quakers, Quakers came together to formally apologize for not doing enough at that time, especially with the massacre, the land grabs, and putting to rest that part of history. At the time that was held at the Orange Street Presbyterian Church, of which they did have members from the Iroquois Confederacy, the Lenape, they had Delaware, they also had Lakota people who had the same affects happening to them as the movement out west happened. And with that came together to put to rest that part of history. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just add to that, the academic recognition of this event has changed immensely over the years. In 1924, the Lancaster County Historical Society gathered uh, a number of other historians and a thousand people out of the Conestoga to um, dedicate a plaque on a big boulder there to the uh, massacre of the Indians on December 14th, uh, 1763. And at that time, there were comments made to the effect that what happened was the natural result of a superior civilization overwhelming an inferior one. And it's difficult to believe that things like that were, were said uh, by historians in front of large groups. But this was 1924. The Ku Klux Klan was, was active then too. That um, sticks in my mind because it, the, the history of this particular incident has changed radically since then. Um, 
in 2013 at the 250th anniversary, LancasterHistory.org, the, the Lancaster County Historical Society, and the University of Pennsylvania held a seminar here on the massacre and the March on Philadelphia and all the related events. And a number of scholars came in from all over the country uh, to give papers about this particular topic. And a number of Native Americans came to that, to those sessions. And it was viewed as a tragedy that this occurred. Um, a tragedy of, of one group of people killing another. It was, it was an entirely different approach to the situation. And I think also of um, when I started working on my book 10, 15 years ago probably, there were some people who said, why do you want to dig up all that old bad history about Lancaster County? Let's I mean, just let that go. That we talk, let's talk about more positive things. I don't hear that anymore. No. Um, this is one of the positive things because of what Mary Ann just talked about. The reconciliation process, the academic process, and, and the recognition that this is part of our history and we, we can become better if we recognize what we did wrong and try to make it right. Yes, I totally agree. I, I want to add part of the historical significance of these facts. It's through programs like you're doing, getting the history out so that people can not only understand, but also heal within these aspects of hearing both sides. And it doesn't have to be something that sad that happened in history, although yes, it was, but through understanding and truthfulness of what is being told, I, I believe will work. And I thank you for doing that. It, history changes. Most people understand that. The history of the massacre of the Conestogas has changed radically over the years. Um, the early records are pretty clear about what happened. We don't know everything because some of the records have been lost, some people didn't say things, and so on. But we know what existed that at the time, and we can base the story on that. But in the 1840s, uh, a, a Lancaster lawyer did a series of articles for the uh, Lancaster Intelligence or Journal uh, newspaper in which he fabricated an entirely new history of what happened in 1763. He essentially blamed the Indians for their own deaths. He created letters and, and um, uh, he created a whole narrative about what happened to suggest that the Scots-Irish were doing uh, everybody a service by killing these bad Indians. Much of this was made up. And it became the story for a long time. Historians for decades, and even now, historians who don't go back to the original record, but quote from this particular lawyer's uh, writings, they have found them way into all kinds of history books. Uh, they, they warp the story to a degree that uh, has contributed to making what happened in Lancaster almost insignificant. The Indians were killed here, that they had it coming. But the important thing is, and this, this story goes, the important thing is that the Paxton boys then went on to Philadelphia. They were stopped to change political pol politics in Pennsylvania forever. And we forget about the Indians who are left lying here, um, the peaceful Indians who were killed here, because, in large part, Redmond Cunningham, this lawyer, changed history in the way historians write about history. Uh, that's been changing over the last 10 to 12 years as uh, more diligent historians do their work. On that note, I'd like to thank our guests for joining us today. As always, if you have questions about today's episode or recommendations for future episodes of Battlefield Pennsylvania, 
please visit our website at PCNTV.com. For everybody here at Battlefield, Pennsylvania, I'm Brady Kreitzer saying so long. Mm -hmm.